where, where do we go? We go to Ephesians chapter 5. Let's go there. Let's check out a few of these verses. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. We're going to go down the line. I'm not going to go over the whole thing like I did last time. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Remember that. Women, you're not to submit yourself to every man. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> because, you know, a lot of people teach that. A lot of people feel that, that, that the woman is to be dominated by every man. Not so. You're to submit. Submit is to reverence your husband. So, again, we, we're not going to go over this whole thing, but basically Jesus has given us an ex- expression, illustration, an example of himself and the church and ourselves and him in responsibility of relationship. Are you with me? It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing when a wife submits to a husband. Da, 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 da. Yes, it is. It's a beautiful thing when a wife submits to a husband she can submit to. That's worth submitting to. <laughs> don't worry. We get the men here in a minute, so don't think this is all, you know, dominance for men and all that stuff. But it's a beautiful thing to see that. So wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto who? The Lord. So despite how your husband really is, if you look at him as unto the Lord, you can serve him even if he's mean and nasty. Hard, hard, but you can still do it. Thank be, thanks be unto God, he's not mean and nasty, our God. So it's easy to submit to him. So watch this. So we're, we're in this progression. Again, we're just reteaching a little bit of it. I always give you something extra. For the husband is what? The head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is what? The savior of the body. What a beautiful picture that is. The husband is the head of the wife. The problem is we can't find most husbands being the head. They're usually the tail. It's the truth. It's the truth. I think, you know, a lot of them were were just born into the earth with a remote control in their hands and a lazy boy. (laughs) Come on, and a couch. And and it's a lot of times it's hard to submit to something like that. But again, you do it as unto the Lord. That's just a picture of marriage. But as far as the picture of Christ is concerned, he's our head, man. He's our head. So it's easy to submit to him. All right, so next verse. Therefore, as a church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. So he's doing a dual teaching here. He's teaching on the church, and he's teaching on marriage. Husbands, love your wives. Woohoo! Not for their cooking, not for what they can give you, but love them. Why? Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. What kind of love is this? Sacrificial love. Not selfish, what can I get out of this relationship? What can I dangle over to get a, you know, a new ring or whatever? You know how things go on in marriage. You have like a bartering going on. Actually, it's more like a mafia deal, you know, some type of drug cartel type of deal. I'll give you this if you do that. Uh, no, here's the deal. I love you, and I'm going to lay down my life for you, even as Christ loved the church. What is this picture we're trying to teach and show? Is that in the end time church, it's going to be a church that loves Christ, not the institution, not the building. I don't care how big we ever get, how many buildings we ever build, or anything like that. There's nothing like the body of Christ. There's nothing like him being the head and, and realizing and recognizing that all this is just metal it's stuff but he is eternal and i'm not going to worship him so i can get something from him i'm going to worship him because he's worthy of it and he's the head of my life see the church doesn't the church doesn't look at that way because the church today looks as as jesus works for them you listen to pastors all the time it sounds like jesus works for them they've cornered god they got god working for them No, God works through you and works with you. You work for him. You're the slave. He is the master. But it's a love thing. It's a beautiful thing, right? So we were were painting that picture last time. We'll just go over a few more verses because I could just redo this whole thing. That he might do what? Sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by word. By the word. So he's trying to cleanse us. How? Through the word. Keep that in your mind, the word. He's washing us. So how do we get to Revelation 19 to become that bride that's made ready? Thank you. By the word. We get cleaned up. Remember I told you uh, the story of Esther and all the other uh, Old Testament queens uh, that were one of many that a king would have as a wife. They spent one year 
beautifying themselves. Ladies would be like, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, one full year of bathing in olive oil and fragrances and flowers and being pampered until that one day, that one night to be with the king. Oh, I'm telling you right now, uh, she made herself ready. This is why I say the church, we're not, we're not performing that because, again, we have a relationship that basically is lazy. Can I do this? Can I just teach? This is extra. Because when we first get married on the honeymoon, baby, it's Victoria's Secrets. Listen to me now. It's hot to trot. It's all these different things. It's whatever. And, and, and then it's holy underwear. Come on, somebody. Y'all ain't helping me now. Unmatched socks. Maybe a bra that fits. Maybe it don't. Can I have help? Can I just have help? Because, you know, we're adults here, folks, some of us. I mean, I'm looking at Mark. Uh, look, at, look at the picture I'm painting to you. Again, this is all extra. I'm painting a picture of one that was ready for that engagement, for that marriage, for that life's journey, and another one who got used to it. I'm telling you, right? lost the love, lost the affection, lost the hot to trot, lost the, the flowers and writing little letters and, and little hearts and kisses and, come on, losing that passion. And the church has done that, and people do that in relationship. It, you just lose it. Come on now. The end time church is a picture of the, of the bride that's ready for the marriage ready. Again, this is a natural example compared to a spiritual example, but I'm preparing myself and falling more in love with Jesus every day and pursuing him because I know one day I'm going to be in his presence forever. See, we, we got to get back to that. We got to get back to that passion. You say, how do you do it, man? You got to submit yourself to Christ. You got to just come to him and say, Lord, forgive me of being, being stale, being stagnant, being boring. You know, a lot of people, they, they don't fall out of love. They just stop loving. Let me try that again. They don't fall out of love. They just stop loving. They just stop making efforts towards their relationship for whatever reasons it is. Remember, love is blind, but marriage is an eye-opener. I feel like I'm talking to myself. You know, <laughs> I mean, went from eye candy to coal. Yeah. Eye candy to coal. Okay, you guys catch that later. You have to go to the Urban Dictionary. All right, check this out. That he might sanctify it. Okay, that he might present it, what? To himself, a glorious church. He's going to present it to himself. I want a glorious church. And again, the same illustration. I want a glorious bride. <laughs> I could go so far with this. I better pull back the reins. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be with holy and without blemish. Okay, I'm not, what did I take you to? Verse 27, that's good. I'm not going to go any further in that. That takes us to part three. Part three, I held back. Man, I did good. Whew. I was going to say something. So part three of the last day's church. So how will this happen? Verse 25 through 27, we just read of Ephesians chapter 5. How's this going to happen? How are we going to become holy without blemish? How is he going to present to us uh, his own church to himself, having, having uh, uh, no spot or wrinkle? How's he going to do this thing? Here is the question I want to present to you along with that question, coupled together. And I ask you, will the rapture fix this? Will the rapture of the church, the pre-tribulation rapture that so many people believe, will that produce this in the minds of so many Christians, especially American Christians, not so much third world or other world Christians, but American Christians, we believe that the rapture fixes all of this, and it, it does not, and it cannot fix it. And I want to share that with you. Because can the rapture produce holiness? No. No. But again, in the mindset of the church folk, they think, well, when that day comes, boop, I'm going to be in heaven, I'm going to be changed, and all these different things. And, you know, 
And I'm going to teach you, I'm going to show you that's not true, and that is actually false teaching that, that makes you rely on a, an event that's going to happen much later, but it is not the transforming event that many people think that it is. Is this okay? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Let's talk about this a minute. We're teaching, right? We're learning something. So I'm trying to get to Revelation 19. The church will get there no matter what. God's going to get us there. Like I say, she's a barroom fly in certain ways. Not all, but some. Clubbing, kicking, clogging. Did they clog anymore? Mark, did they clog anymore? I remember clogging. Couldn't tell me. All right. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. There it is, pastor. I told you we're going to be changed by the rapture. Well, first of all, I'm not going to go into the totality of the last trump. The last trump, you can find it in the book of Revelation, by the way. Not before tribulation, but you find it near the end of tribulation, certain parts uh, around there. So let's not talk about that. We want to talk about being changed. Now, here's, here's the deal. The word change in the Greek means to be altered. My physical body, your physical body, should we be alive when Christ returns at the second coming, not at the pre-tribulation uh, theory, but when he really comes at the parousia, which is his appearing when he does that, our bodies, if we're alive, will be altered. In other words, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the greatest Jenny Craig weight loss program you've ever seen. Thank you, Miss Sarah, for helping out. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. She's like, mm, you need it. Uh, I'm going to go from uh, uh, corruptible to incorruptible, right? I'm going to go from earthly body to a celestial body. I'm going to go from jubby wubby, come on somebody, to spiritual strong man, and you strong woman. We're going to be what? Changed. We're going to be altered, and our bodies are fit for what? Eternity. That's what the Bible says. How that happens is a miracle. How that happens cannot be explained scientifically. We just are totally changed. And the dead shall what? Rise in Christ. And they will have their glorified bodies. So that day is coming. There's an altering coming to our lives. But that's not a transformation. Ready for that? This is a translation. I'm being translated out of this earthly realm into a heavenly realm. I'm being transported, if you will, out of this life into the next life. But I am not transformed. In other words, what I is and what I've do's and what I've done in my body before that time and at that time is it. You understand? There comes a day that there will be no more time. There will be no more uh, progress, no more work. So that doesn't fix us. But you have so many in the church that think, I ain't worried about it, man. It's going to be raptured on out of here. <laughs> My name's written in the land book of life. I'm gone. I don't, you know, all those things are nice, but you're not going to be raptured out of here until the end. Now, what are you going to do if you survive and live between now and the end? What am I going to do? Uh, I need to be transformed because I'm not going to be translated. Does this make any sense? But people put their money, their lives, they bank into the fact, especially American churches. Man, I've got a parachute. I'm out of here. Golden parachute, baby. I ain't worried about none of this. Let the place burn. How many of all know you have friends like that, people like that? Let's go look at 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6 through 17. It's going to be a little bit of reading here, but I want to explain this to you. I want you to see something. I'm going to read it through the Amplified while we scroll up behind me and on live stream on King James Version. Is that okay? So the rapture is not going to, to transform us. We are going to be translated, right? So let's look at this, and I'll try to read it, kind of look it up, see what you guys have here, who also made us able ministers. Okay, so verse 6, who has qualified us, making us to be fit and worthy, sufficient as ministers and dispensers of a new covenant 
of salvation through Christ, not ministers of the letter of legally written code, but of the Spirit. Now, remember, I'm reading Amplified. For the code of the law kills, but the Holy Spirit makes alive. Now, if the dispensation of death engraved in letters on stone, the ministration of the law, talking about Moses, was inaugurated with such glory and splendor that the Israelis, or Israelites, excuse me, were not able to look steadily at the face of Moses because of its brilliance, a glory that was to fade and pass away. Now notice he's talking about the, the original glory, the original law and the original glory, Old Testament. Why should not the dispensation of the Spirit his spiritual ministry, whose task is to cause men to obtain and to be governed by the Holy Spirit, be attended with much greater and more splendid glory. Do you see? So what is he saying in, in the beginning of this part of this teaching? He's telling us that there's a transition of transformation going from the letter of the law that kills and the glory that was only on one man, Moses, that now is given to us by the administration of the Holy Ghost, and the glory is now on us. Y'all need to catch this. So we are, are progressing as a church. We're supposed to be progressing as a people. Is that right? The rapture doesn't do that. The rapture, in the true sense of the rapture, is the finality of the transportation out of here from your transformation. <laughs> Okay, it's the bus stop, but we got, we got to go through some stuff, okay? So why not, verse 8, why, uh, why should not the dispensation of the Spirit, the spiritual ministry, whose task it is to cause men to obtain to be governed by the Holy Spirit, be attended with much greater and more splendid glory, as we said, for the service that condemns the ministration of doom and glory uh, excuse me, the ministration of doom had glory, how infinitely more abounding in splendor and glory must be the service that makes the righteous, the ministry that produces and fosters righteous living and right standing with God. So how does it say in the King James, for even that which was made glorious had no glory in its respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. So in other words, there was... There was glory, the kavad, if you will, in the Old Testament, Hebrew, the glory that was there, but it was a message of doom and gloom. Think about the law. Don't do this. Don't do that. And with it came what? Death, came punishment, these different things. Well, Jesus came to give us grace and to give us life more abundantly. He did not null and void the law. He took the sting out of it. Is anybody with me? He took the sting out of death. He took the sting out of sin. He took the sting out of transgressions by how? His blood and grace. Are you seeing this? And the Holy Spirit is teaching us this that they could know. They could only stand below the mount and see Moses and the glory of God and turn their backs and say, we don't ever want to hear this again. They didn't want to hear God. They were afraid of him. We have a different reverence. Jesus went to the holy place, sprinkled his blood. Is that right? Upon the mercy seat, which gave us access. He ripped the veil. He tore the veil and gave us entrance into it by faith. Now we do what? Boldly enter into what possession is ours. We fear God in that we reverence him, but we don't fear God into where we're paralyzed and don't do anything. It's a big difference between reverence and fear. Okay, so you catch where I'm going with this? This is what he's teaching us. So indeed, in the view of this fact, what once had splendor, the glory of the law in the face of Moses, has come to what? Has splendor, has no splendor at all because of the overwhelming glory that exceeds and excels it, which is the glory or the glory of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ. For if that which was but passing and fading away came with splendor, watch this, here's the punchline, how much more must that which remains and is permanent abide in glory and splendor? 
See, what Moses had passed, what we have remains. Since we have such glorious hope, such joyful and confident, this is verse 12, confident expectation, we speak very freely and openly and fearlessly. Nor do we act like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze upon the finish of the vanishing splendor which he had upon it. In fact, their minds were grown hard and calloused, that they become dull and had lost the power of understanding. For until this present day, when the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, is being read, the same veil still lies on them. It's still upon them. Is that true? Absolutely it's true. Not being lifted to reveal that in Christ, everybody say in Christ, that in Christ it is made void and done away. Yes, verse 15. Down to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies upon their minds and their hearts. This is not just pertaining to Israel today and people uh, from, from Israel that believe in Old Testament. This is also for folks in the church that don't understand the new and living way of relationship with Christ, don't understand what God is doing in the church and through you, and why do you exist? You don't exist to get stuff. You don't get to, to exist to try to achieve a bank account that you're going to give away when you're gone. You exist, number one, to serve God, number two, to serve creation, to give your gifts away the best that you possibly can. And in, in, the, in the meantime, you get to enjoy life. I'm not talking about being a hermit or a monk or a priest or some type of, you know, a nun. We're talking about living that abundant life that says, you know what, God, if you can get it to me, you can get it through me. Let me tell you something. If you learn how to give, they say money now. We're not talking about money. I already took up an offering, right? Flo, I'm looking at you. We're going to take up another. Uh, no, we don't do that. If you can get love through you, love's going to come back at you. If you just be benevolent to people, it's going to come back at you. That's just the way it is. It's called what? The law of sowing and reaping. Any man that lends unto the poor lends unto who? God. And God always repays dividends that are beyond your imagination. Watch this, verse 17. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty or emancipation from bondage and freedom. All of us, as with unveiled face, because we continue to behold the word of God. Notice that. We continue to behold the word of God. Let's see how it reads here. But we all with an open face, beholding in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed. Everybody say changed. That's not the same as 2 Corinthians 15, 52. That word is we're transformed. <laughs> Watch this. We're transformed into what? His, his glory. We're being transfigured into his glory or the very image in ever-increasing splendor and from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is that spirit. Now, I went around Mount Sinai for a reason of the Old Testament to bring you to a New Testament revelation. We are to behold the glory of God, and when we do, how do we do it? Through the word of God, we are transformed. Watch this now. So it's not that I attend a church service, I'm transformed. I'm transformed by the word being preached in that service. I'm being transformed by the spirit of God in that service that's being sung because the words of God are anointed in the songs. I, 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 I'm transformed because I'm in the atmosphere of the word of God. I'm transformed because I read my Bible at home and I look into that glass mirror, if you will, and I see myself and I am transformed or transfigured into the image of Christ. It's not do's and don'ts of the Old Testament just reading the Bible. You better read your Bible every day. You need to read 5,000 chapters before you go to bed. Trust me, if you have problems sleeping, listen, this is, a, this is better than any medication on the planet. If you have trouble sleeping, start reading the Bible. Can somebody wave and say, that is the truth? I could be wide awake and start reading. All of a sudden, <laughs> all right? Or try praying. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's so true, isn't it? 
But the word of God transforms you and he translates you. And that's what the church has been missing because we've been putting our trust in entertainment, some guy standing up here, some six foot icicle, you know, rainbow color, all kind of, you know, whatever, zebra dude, whatever, just looking towards the front podium as entertainment to feed us. Come on, I'm not a zookeeper. I'm not here to give you food like a seal. I'm here to bring you fresh bread and manna, enough for you to take it home and you bake your own bread. Sound good, don't it? You make your own loaf. You make your own food. You take and you 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 take these ingredients that I'm giving you, and then and then you partake of it and watch it grow in your life. Remember, ever, ladies, some of y'all remember friendship bread. That yeast thing will last a thousand years and three nuclear wars, if you keep it cool enough. I knew somebody. Uh, uh, we knew somebody in old church. I don't know how many fifteen twenty years she had the same yeast that she'd been working with, and I'm going to say that bread was dynamite. Yeah. Come on. You take the word, and you cultivate it. You do it. And what happens? We become transformed. Not looking towards an institution of a church to transform us, and then hoping one day we just go to heaven and everything, you know, well, I hope I did okay down here. He's not, he's not, the bride, the body of Christ, the end time church is going to be a church that's transformed by the word of God. Look at the video I showed you of the Chinese church. That's just one video of, of multiple thousands of videos of churches all around the world underground of people who are just so hungry for the word of God. So hungry for the word of God. They're desperate and thirsty for the word of God. Watch this. Their relationship with God is passionate and it's new to them. Unlike us, again, sometimes we're in a relationship for so long. Ah, it's old Harry. <laughs> That's old Hildegard. Yeah, here she comes. Come on now. You know, you get married, you, you, you're married for a long time. You can finish each other's sentences. You know what each other's thinking. Right? It's the truth. Sometimes they don't even let you get in a word edgewise when you're talking to the conversation. But what they do say is exactly what you would have said. So you just shut up and go, mm hmm Is anybody here? So the rapture, watch this. What time I got? I got, I got another hour. Okay. The rapture cannot and will not make us spotless, blameless, and a bride who's made herself ready. We're already walking in that. We're already, we're already working towards that as an end-time church. So it's not an event that makes us perfect in the sense of our righteousness and what we're supposed to be doing. The bride has made herself ready. Only the word can. I want you to write that down. It's not the rapture. Only the word can make you ready. It's only the word. Which means, watch this, which means I must follow the process and the progress of the word no matter where it's leading me. So see, here, here's, here's where I'm trying to go. You've got to have mature ears to hear. I can't trust on church culture to get me there. I can't trust church trends to get me there. I can't trust my culture in general to get me there. I have to trust the word. What is the word saying? I can't look towards an institution and say, uh, this is the way that I should go. I can't. I have to look towards what the word says. Now, the institution or the church or the organization, it can be following the word, and then that's when you jump in the bus. That's when you get on and say, okay, I'm going this way with these guys. But if they're not going the way the word, you got to get off at the next stop. In fact, don't even wait for the stop. Just roll. You ever rolled out of a car before? Just roll. Get out of that thing. Why? It's better for you to do that than end up in a bad place. But so many people in the church, they look towards church culture and everything going on. In fact, most people go to church because the culture they live privately matches the church culture publicly, and they make a connection. They say, yeah, I like that. They ain't getting fed. They don't have no word, but they, they bounce up and down. They're doing, you know. Anybody here? The same thump, boom, bass, with say the lights, cameras, whatever it is, the guitar, the mandolin, the banjo. It doesn't matter. It reflects who they are privately, and they see that, and they join it publicly with never finding out about the word. 
That's good preaching right there. And I'm trying to just teach. You have to be led by the word. Now, don't get me wrong. There are things about the institution of a church or a building or organization that are attractive that a lot of people come for. And I get that. I understand. I understand that. But at the end of the day, those things don't transform you. The word does. The word does. All the other things that we do mostly as churches, is a lot of it's entertainment. Just keep the troops entertained. Keep the money coming in. Keep everybody happy. I don't want you mad at me because I know you got money. <laughs> you know it's the truth. And the pastor ain't going to say nothing offensive. He ain't going to get in your grill. He's not going to tell truth. And, you know, in love, he's not going to do that because he, he doesn't want to rock the boat. I don't want to rock your boat. I want to flip it over. I want to flip it over. I literally do because I want to see your life transformed into what? The image of Christ. And if what you're doing right now isn't getting you there, it ain't working. So you got to have intervention. You got to have somebody come in your life and intercept you and say, look, whoa, wait a minute. What you're doing is not a real church. What you're doing is not Bible, man. What you're doing is, 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 is all part of culture. It's all part of just the institution of, of uh, rituals or whatever. Whether, whatever what, it doesn't matter where you're from. Does that make any sense? So I have to follow that. I have to follow the word. So if the word tells me to live righteously and holy and tells me not to do this and do that, and stay away from pornography and stay away from narcotics and stay away from alcohol and stay away from these different things and the vices of life, then I should do my best to do that. In fact, there are a lot of things you shouldn't do at all. But I should make every effort to live as clean as I possibly can. Again, according to Scripture. Now, if you, you listen to certain songs or whatever, that's between you and God. I'll, I'll confess, I listened to Steve Miller on the way here, a couple songs. Is that okay? Please don't condemn me. Steve Miller, man, man, I just threw on some old old sounds. I just wanted to hear some of these old songs. Is anybody with me? All right, I'm not doing the goat signal and sign and freaking out and foaming at the mouth. You understand what I'm saying? I'll tell you another sin, and another sin that you'll think is, is terrible. My wife has Darius Rucker in her car. A couple albums. She's bad. And drinks Diet Pepsi. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I'm, am I advocating secular music? No, I'm just, what I'm trying to tell you is there are, there are absolutes you don't do. Then there's things of conscience. There's things of what, what do you feel in your heart that's between you and God. Come on, somebody. If, if there's a love song you like, it's great. As long as you're singing to your one you love, your wife, you know, or your husband. Are you with me? I'm going to get letters now. Steve Miller, man, who's that? Uh, it's an old praise and worship band, man, back in the 70s or something. Shot a man robbing his castle. Somebody remember that? Okay. Would you? Yeah, Space Cowboy. Well, see, a lot of people don't realize he hit it. A lot of things, the, the Lord pulls a lot of things out of me during messages that people in the 70s and 80s can catch. And, and he's done that to, for my entire ministry. It's been that way. And so I, I go back and revert sometimes and pick up stuff, and then it just pops back out. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. Anyhow, why did I say all that? Oh, no, it's confession night, I guess. But I got I to gotta be led where the Spirit of God leads me. I got to be led where the, where the Word leads me in my life and head to where he's headed, not to where, again, culture or an institution has taken me to. I don't care how fancy and famous the pastor is. He could have a fleet of Bentleys. I don't care. Who cares about a Bentley? I, I, you know, if I owned a Bentley, I would have to park six blocks away from Walmart to walk. Because I'll be afraid someone will ding it. That, come on, Flo, help me. That ain't like your Kia, where they take a toilet plunger and pop the dent back out. Bentley, they got to go back and rehand carve it and crave it and whatever they crave it. Yeah, whatever they do to that thing, man. No way, I'm good. 
In fact, a lot of the rich people don't even drive uh, some of their fancy cars in normal settings. Anyways, let's let's go on. <laughs> so let's go to John chapter 17. Man, do I have time for this? I'm going to try to break this part of the bread open. I'm going to read to you. This is, this is probably one of the most fascinating portions of scripture. I really, really love this part. I'm, I'm going to do it justice, so I'm not going to speed up. I'm going to I'm going to read this to you, but how is Jesus' prayer answered? I want you to write that down in your notes because we're going to get to it later in this teaching. I'm not going to do it tonight. I've got like 10 minutes. How is Jesus' prayer answered? You're going to see this unfold very beautifully, and I'm going to read with you in the King James. I didn't pull it out of the Amplified. Watch this. Let's go to verse 1. It's going to be a little lengthy, but it's worth it. Watch this. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hours come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. There's so much doctrinal power in this teaching. I can't do it all. Verse 2. And thou hast, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now, O Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus has always been and proves the Trinity. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Now, he's speaking here about the the, the disciples and the apostles and those whom he ministered to, but it also is in connection with us. You'll see that later. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. So there's proof. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I have come out from thee, and they believe that thou didst send me. But notice what he says here. What did he give them? The word. He didn't say I gave them power. I gave them, I gave them the word. Okay? I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. All are mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in who? Them. He's going to get his glory, folks. He's already getting his glory, but he's going to get a greater glory. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, Keep through thine own name those who thou hast given me, that they may be one as what? We are one. That's, he's praying for unity. He's praying that the church becomes one. Not one denomination, one body. We fragmented the body by making institutions called denominations. We did that. That actually happened in the beginning of the, of, of the 19th century, beginning with the, the, uh, of the Azusa Street Revival in America. It blossomed into denominations, the oneness movement, the holiness movement, the Pentecostal holiness, on and on. We just divided ourselves. It wasn't supposed to be that way. Watch. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in my name that thou... Uh, Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have joy fulfilled in themselves. He's speaking what? Words, right? Okay, going to have joy. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Man, that's powerful. So much joy theology here. I prayed not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. No pre-trib rapture. 
Notice his prayer. Don't take them out of the world. Don't remove them out of the world. There's only one way you can come out of the world. Leave the planet. He's not talking about sanctification is a whole other subject. He's talking about, I don't pray to take them out of the world. But how come the church wants to get out of the world? Are you, are you is anybody here? Is this on? Look at this. Don't take them, leave them. Jesus, don't you love me? Yeah, stay right there. Because I need you. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil, or some translations say the evil one. Why is he saying this? Let me read it again. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil or the evil one. Watch some of this translation here into the Greek. Keep means to go. It means to guard, to observe, and to watch over. I want to protect them. I am going to keep them here, but Lord, I want you to keep them from the evil one. Keep them from the evil one. Who's that? The devil. It even goes further and represents the Antichrist. It represents anything that is evil and the intentions to destroy you. So he, Jesus is praying, Lord, don't remove them, keep them here, and I will watch over them, and you will watch over them and protect them from the evil. But the church wants to leave because it's evil. Do you see? The last day's church, the end times church, is to be a church that's kept in the battle knowing that our protector liveth. Well, I don't like what I'm seeing in the world. I don't like the struggles of my flesh and humanity and the things we go through and, and the fights we have physically, whatever, emotionally, mentally. But I'm going to be kept in this world, and God's going to protect me and provide and watch over me. And should we be blessed enough to make it to the end of the trail, the end of the course for the last day's movement of the Spirit of grace, we're going to be provided for. Watch this. The word take means, you ready for this? It means to remove, but it also means to sail away. Sailing, sailing away. Da, da, da. Christopher Cross, 1980. Anybody know it? Thank you. Da, da, to where I want to be. Okay. I pray that thou shouldest take them out of the world. Take them out of Sail away. See, again, the mindset and the false teaching of a pre-tribulation rapture means I'm going to sail away. Jesus said, I don't want them to sail away. I know canvases can do miracles. That's part of the words, by the way. I, 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 I don't want to be taken out. Of, he, wants you to stay, he wants you to stay in the fight. Not to sail away. But you talk to most Christians, especially in the Bible Belt like this area. I'm out of here, dude. Fast as a twinkling of an eyeball. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Raise our lives, tell them we're out of here. You're not out of here. You're staying. Now, see, most people are going to be mad and don't like me no more, but that's okay. You'll like me later when it starts to happen and you realize you're going to be here for the long haul. Tell the truth or lie, one or the other. I'm going to tell the truth. So it means to sail away. So I thought some of the old 80s guys would like that. Christopher Cross. So he's still singing, I think. Man, you know what? I'm going to have to stop because I'm, I'm, I'm going to break this thing open deeper that I really, the Lord took me on this little journey here. But, but this, this thing, this thing is amazing truth here. Go to the next verse. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. But notice this, we're staying in the world, but we're not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. I'm going to run around this building and break this microphone. He just said to get to Revelations 19 to be that bride, she made herself ready. But how does he do it? Ephesians chapter 5 says what? By the washing of the water of the word. I just showed you that the word does it. So in his prayer, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. 
I'm following the word. If the word says we go through tribulation, we go through it. If the word says we're going to go through famine, we're going to go through it. If the word says and prophecy proves that we're going to have hard times, but he's going to be the great provider and the great I am, I'm going to follow word and follow truth rather than some guy up here who's lying to the folks for money. Because I'm going to tell you, good words and good sermons and good messages about fluffy, duffy, uh, cotton candy Christianity brings in big bucks, big bucks into the house of God. But I'm going to tell you what, long-lasting finances, long-lasting blessings comes from truth. That's why I tell the truth. And I don't have to worry about it because God pays all the bills. I don't have to cater to anybody. I, I love you and I'll be nice to you, you know, but I'm going to speak what the word says. So the last day's church, we're going to get into it next, next, next week. But we're going we're gonna to figure out how, to, how are we going to answer this prayer. That's a prayer from Jesus. Y'all realize that he prayed to God for an answer. We are that answer. We've got to get to that answer. Father, we love you. We thank you for truth tonight. Bless us as we bless you and bless others. Give us a safe uh, ending to our week. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys. Don't forget those back there. Uh, also, pray for California, man. They're really getting hit with a storm.